I kind of moved to Boston to start my internship at Facebook and the first night I got there um, I had experienced like my first like I think ever sexual harassment and was in a lift ride so we were going from the airport we pull up to my apartment and then he like reaches behind and like blocks the handle of the door and I think the part that was really scary was like he was blocking my exit I was like okay I know if I give them my number then I'll get a chance to leave and I kind of like brushed that aside, but then over the summer it actually happened two more times. The third time it happened, I started maybe shifting my mindset, being like, okay, maybe this isn't my fault, maybe it's not just me. Um, maybe there could be a problem with how the company is like taking in drivers and training them. That's like making them think this behavior is acceptable. Teal King is a computer science major at Stanford University. She proposed several changes to Lyft's app after a student tour of Lyft's headquarters. Even when I got this opportunity to go like tour tech companies in the Bay and I like saw that Lyft was on the list, I didn't um, think that I would talk about my story there. I just had this huge emotional reaction um, and I was crying. Um, and then I finished my like first question by asking them like what they're planning to do to improve safety. They kind of jumped to the assumption that like a solution would be a call center to have like a more personable experience when you're reporting. Um, and they're like, that's way too expensive. I was kind of shell-shocked. I was like, that's the only that's, that's the only solution that you see. And from there, um, I kind of immediately got down to brainstorming again. I was like, okay, how can I give them like three, two or three like really easy engineering fixes? I was lucky that one of the engineers actually did listen to me. Um, she teamed up with me and had me kind of send over pictures of the current user reporting process. And we developed maybe a pitch that she could give to her team. And over the next few months, the responses that I got from her slowed down. She said that it had gotten pushed from operations to trust and safety. So in December, uh, I had a call with a trust and safety rep and she didn't really talk at all about my suggestions. It was mainly, I think, like damage control. Soon after, Teal King wrote a column in the Stanford Daily criticizing Lyft's response to her concerns, including a submission form for others to share their stories of harassment. She and a classmate launched the Instagram account, Take Back the Ride, highlighting some of those stories. After the column ran, Teal King took her campaign back to Lyft, who invited her to present her critique in person. And then I proposed these solutions, so I just gave them ways to like make it more empathetic and reduce the number of steps it takes, and also just prioritize like help in the app, because it's kind of varied in every step of the process, where like the help um, menu option is the very bottom, or like when you click on a ride, you have to scroll to the bottom of the screen to then report it. So it was just very out of the way and hard to find. So what I wanted to hear from them was, I guess, more empathy, um, more acknowledgement of what I was going through, and maybe recognition that this is a bigger problem than just me. Uh, I got the sense that my issue is like too small to have them like dedicate resources to it. And I also felt like it was hypocritical because they would preface every response by saying, yeah, like safety is our number one priority. But the words that came after each time were like not the case, like not demonstrating that. Representatives of drivers who are often vocal critics of ride hailing companies say they welcome sexual harassment training. Having taken many sexual harassment courses as a supervisor, I think anybody whether the man or woman could benefit from those types of courses. The stories that I hear from both female passengers and female drivers are kind of horrendous. Some of the things they experience just aren't okay. So I'm an advocate of just about any training that they would want to provide. Training is only one piece of the puzzle. Uber implemented ongoing driver background checks in 2018 and says that since then it has removed more than 20,000 drivers. In April, Lyft announced its continuous background checks, but it declined to share concrete data on the number of drivers removed from its service. Uber was first to add a panic button to its app in 2018. Lyft announced in May it would add a similar function sometime this year. In the same blog post, it also said it would make changes to its platform, increasing the visibility of the driver's license plate number in the app, creating a voluntary sexual harassment training for drivers, and adding the ability to call 911 in the app. Lyft constantly like stresses how safety is its number one priority, but in reality, I believe that like image is its top priority. Internally, Uber and Lyft have used forced arbitration as a tool to prevent employees from joining sexual harassment class action lawsuits. The companies ended that practice within hours of each other in May 2018. Lyft declined to provide a representative for comment, but in its IPO documents, Lyft says, the strength of our brand is a key driver of our ability to attract and retain users and serves as a strategic differentiator. 
We believe that affinity for our brand will continue to strengthen as consumers increasingly gravitate toward brands that are purpose-driven and emphasize corporate social responsibility. I think Lyft did a good job of setting themselves up through PR as looking like the good guy in this picture. And now I think that Uber has come forward and said, hey, we recognize that we've made mistakes and we're trying to make changes. I think the true colors of Lyft have started to show. I think the outpouring of responses I got was like very unexpected. Teachers, like colleagues, like all types of people who I didn't think had gone through this, like came forward to me and shared these stories. They felt like this story could have impact and like get Lyft to make change. Maybe the mindset that these companies have is they're just trying to go against each other and be the company that's better than the other. But I think that needs to change to just like setting a new standard because maybe they're making these incremental changes to get better, but I think it's not fast enough. For now, there is no definitive data on how many riders are sexually harassed by these drivers. Both companies have promised to release transparency reports, but neither have as of May 2019.